Hello, and welcome to this recorded web seminar where we will provide you with an overview and introduction to influenza. This webinar is part of a series of webinars sponsored by Live Process. The three webinars are intended for emergency management professionals at hospitals and other healthcare organizations to provide you with useful information as you manage the H1N1 event in 2009 and 2010. This first webinar is meant as a general introduction to influenza. If you're an emergency coordinator or manager but don't have a medical background, this webinar will give you a quick overview. The second webinar will discuss the new OSHA procedures released in November 2009 and how they can impact your organization. And finally, the third webinar will provide some useful tips on managing H1N1 as an ongoing long-term event. I encourage you to view all of these recordings at the website you see on this slide. I'll be your host for this recording, and my name is Mitch Saratari. I'm the Vice President of Quality and Compliance at Live Process, a provider of a web-based software platform for healthcare emergency preparedness and incident management. Our speaker for this and the other webinars is Annalie Grady Erickson. I've had the pleasure to work with Annalie over the last few years on several different projects. Annalie has an extensive background, and since 2001, Annalie worked for the State of Minnesota's Department of Public Safety and is currently focused on the department's continuity of operations and pandemic planning. Previously, she was the Infectious Disease Outbreak Program Coordinator and worked in radiological emergency preparedness in the Department's Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Anneli has extensive experience in radiological emergency preparedness, developing pandemic influenza planning and preparedness programs for both the public and private sector, and has a general hazard planning and preparedness experience. She teaches around the country on pandemic, influenza, H1N1, and other topics, and is co-author of the book, Pandemic Influenza, Emergency Planning, and Community Preparedness, which is available on Amazon.com. Annalie, thank you so much for participating in these webinars with Live Process. I know you have some excellent information, so I will gladly hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Mish. I'd like to start out with a quote from Secretary, or former Secretary, Mike Levitt. From, he used to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Pandemics happen. Let me acknowledge that this is a hard thing to talk about. Anything we say in advance of a pandemic happening is warmest, and anything we say afterwards inadequate. And quite honestly, for you planners out there, isn't that the way it is for pretty much every type of preparedness activity that you do for planning? It doesn't matter what type of, of disaster or what you're planning for. It's just it's the amount of money and time up front, you know, it's always people look at it as alarmist. And then afterwards, it's like, why didn't you do more? Why didn't you do more? So let's talk about the virus. The virus for influenza is orthomyoxivirus, or orthomyoxiviridae. That's the type of, that's the name of the virus itself. There are three different types of viruses, orthomyoxiviruses, influenza viruses, if you will. There's type A. And type A is the type of the influenza that we are most concerned with. This is the one, this type of influenza is the only one that deals with H's and N's. If you see any type of H1N1 or H5N1 or H2N2, whatever you've got, those types of influenza are specific type A influenza. Type A influenza is found in a multiple species. It is the most virulent types. This is the type of influenza that actually does shifts and drifts. It is classified by those H's and N's. Those are called surface antigens. There are 16 different H's and 9 different N's. So that makes a combination, if you can do the math, of 144 different um, different combinations of H1 or H's and N's. However, within each of those, H1N1 or H2N2 or H3N2, you're going to find different clades and different subclades. So they actually, once they classify an, an influenza type A as you know, H1N1 or H5N1, whatever it is, um, but then they will actually classify it even further. This is a nice diagram. It actually shows you how the type A influenza replicates. Remember those H's and N's that we were talking about? What happens is the, the surface antigens, you can see the, on the diagram, the H's are the red spikes that are coming off, and the N's, the neuraminidase, is the, the golf tee looking um, spike that's coming off. And the H actually works and it actually unlocks the cell. So the virus comes up to it, the H attaches, the H on the tip of that H, it's got uh, sticky material on it. And that actually works as an unlocking mechanism. So the H allows the virus entry into the cell. It actually does a reassortment with the cell material, the cell DNA, et cetera. And what pops out is, you know, a different virus. 
it could have reassorted. It could have become something different. It could have shifted. It could have drifted. And, but it is still attached to the cell. And so what the end does, the neuraminidase, the end, that golf tee looking thing, it, it's shaped that way. Um, well, and it, what it does is it, it, it actually wipes off the tip of that, that H. It bends up a little bit, and it, that will allow the virus to actually you know, disengage from the cell to, and pop off and then go and infect other cells. Okay, so you've heard of antivirals or Tamiflu or Lenza. Those are antivirals. They're also known as neuraminidase inhibitors. So what that H does, what that Tamiflu does to that H, or, or to the N, excuse me, it actually caps off that Gulf T. So if you've taken Tamiflu or any other type of neuraminidase inhibitors after you've gotten sick, the H, the, the hemagglutinin will still unlock the cell. It will still do its reassortment. It was, the, the virus will still pop out, it will still butt out, but the neuraminidase will not be able to function. It, the, the Tamiflu actually inhibits the neuraminidase and caps off the top of that Gulf tea. The other two types of orthomyxoviruses are type B and type C. Type B influenza is also found in humans. It is somewhat common. But you're not, you're not going to have epidemics, pandemics, et cetera. You'll never have a pandemic from type B, but you're going to have epidemics less frequently than you would in a type A. And where you're going to find type B type outbreaks is close facilities like um, correctional facilities or nursing homes or places like that where the people that are in there are somewhat confined. That's where you're going to find an outbreak of type B influenza. Then there's type C influenza, and this is actually the less the least virulent type of influenza. Most everybody has had type C influenza by 16, by the time that you're 16. Uh, it's rare that you're going to get any significant complications due to this, and it's also found in humans and in swine. So we talked a little bit earlier, I mentioned it, a little bit about shift and drift. What's the difference? Well, seasonal influenza, you're actually going to get, that is the drift. What happens with that, it just changes just a little bit. When you have a big shift, when, when things change up, when you get a pandemic, that's when you get a shift. Even influenza, influenza in itself is actually a zoonotic disease. It can actually be passed from both the animals to the humans, and what we're finding with 2009 H1N1, it can actually be passed from the humans back to the animals. There's been numerous animals that have gotten H1N1 from their, from their owners or people that take, to actually take care of those animals from the, the farmers. Uh, you've seen it in ferrets. You've seen it in cats. Most recently, dogs. You've seen it in chickens and pigs and in turkeys. So as you can tell, there, that virus, the virus itself, it's still, it's still very, very, very fluid. It's still moving back and forth. Ron, well, Lisa, you're saying that you can pass this H1N1 back to your cow pets? Back, I'm sorry, say again? You can pass the H1N1 virus from the, back to your household pets? Yes, you could pass it back to your household pets. And when H5N1 was very, well, what everybody was thinking that it was going to be the next pandemic, one of the questions that I always got on the phone was, well, what about my dog, my hunting dog? Because it's a zoonotic disease, and if it's still a disease that is in the birds and it's staying in the birds, you know, if if there is a, an outbreak of H5N1 and I'm out duck hunting and my my retriever goes out to fetch the duck that I've killed and bring it back, it, does it have the possibility that that bird could infect, you know, the dog itself and in turn infect our family? And I, from before, before this last couple of months, I always said, no, there's no way. But influenza, anybody that thinks that they know all there is to know about influenza, <laughs> I would venture to bet that there's a lot. This influ influenza virus itself, it, it's a, it, it'll, it'll change your mind because anything that you thought wasn't possible with it pretty much probably is. So, yes, you do have the ability to pass the, the virus on to your household pet. The one thing that I wanted to, to bring up about this slide, it, it's the pig, swine flu, or the pig in general. Avian can actually infect, the avian influenza virus can actually infect pigs. Human influenza virus can also affect pigs. So you have the ability then for it to actually, the pig becomes the mixing vessel, where both of those types of influenza virus, in addition to swine influenza, 
and what can pop out of there if that pig is infected or has been infected with other types of influenza at the same time. What could pop out of there is, you know, a separate virus. But one thing that I want you to be cautious of when you start thinking about this, just because, you know, that virus has popped out does not mean that that virus has sustained human-to-human -human transmission. It does not mean, because right now we're seeing a lot, uh, this recently this week, uh, a mutation in the 2009 H1N1 virus in both Norway and in the Ukraine. But even though there's a mutation in the virus, that new mutation has not actually had sustained transmission between, between humans. So it's still, you know, separate 